Hello everyone, this is Victor and in this video I want to go over some of the most common types of the SN2 exam questions that you are likely to see on your next exam. But before we jump in, let's quickly review what we have learned in the last video. And by the way, if you haven't seen it yet, I strongly suggest you go ahead and watch it before uh, continuing with this one. Alright. So, first of all, the SN2 reaction is a bimolecular reaction, uh, which rate depends on the concentration of both nucleophile and the substrate. So, if my substrate is the Rx here, and the nucleophile is this Nu, that means that if I increase the concentration of my substrate, let's say by the factor of 2, the rate is going to increase by the factor of 2 as well. If I do the same thing with a nucleophile, the rate will increase as well. If I increase or decrease the concentration of both of those, that means that the rate will adjust accordingly. Next, the SN2 reaction is a concerted mechanism, which means that we are forming no intermediates of any sort. The reaction requires the backside attack, which means that if we have any meaningful stereochemistry in our reaction, we are going to cause the inversion of that stereochemistry. So if, let's say, your living group was sitting on the dash, the new nucleophile is going to end up on the wedge, and the other way around. The SN2 reactions are extremely sensitive towards any kind of steric hindrances, so they work best for primary or secondary alkyl halides or living groups in general. The more you have going on around the living group, the less reactive it is going to be. We also do need a good nucleophile, and finally, we prefer polar aprotic solvents here. All right. We're going to start with a few simple examples here. And so for the question one, it is to simply predict the products of these reactions. And by the way, for all of those reactions, what I suggest you do, you pause the video first, solve those, and see if your solution is correct or not. All right, are we ready to go? So the first reaction over here, I have iodine, which is going to be my leaving group, so that is the leaving group. I also have cyanide, CN-, that's going to be my nucleophile. Sodium here is merely spectator ion, so I'm just going to cross it out. Also, this CH3CN, that is the acetonitrile, so that is my polar aprotic solvent, which I like to abbreviate as PAPS. In the course of this reaction, the cyanide is going to perform the nucleophilic attack on the carbon with our leaving group, which is going to displace the iodine, giving me the final product that's going to look like this, where I have the cyanide instead of my iodine. Notice that the atom with the leaving group, this carbon over here, does not have any meaningful stereochemistry, which means that there is nothing for me to indicate in, in terms of flipping of the stereochemistry or stereochemical inversion. In the next example, however, I again have a good polar aprotic solvent, so this is my polar aprotic solvent, and as I've mentioned in my previous video, it is a good idea to just remember the list of the most common polar aprotic solvents. Then I have sodium as my spectator ion, so I'm going to cross it out, and I have HS-, minus, which is going to be my nucleophile. The living group in this case is sitting on this carbon over here, and I am seeing that my living group is sitting on the dash, which which means that if reaction were to happen and my sulfur were to displace this bromine like that, the sulfur would have to attack from the front face of this molecule, meaning that uh, the sulfur will end up looking at us. So if I were to draw my final product, that would be something like that, where the sulfur is now looking at me, and of course we have hydrogen which is still connected to my sulfur. And in the last question here on this page, I have sodium azide. Sodium is my spectator ion again, so I'm just going to cross it out. The azide ion is an amazing nucleophile and has the following structure where, where we have three nitrogens in a line like this, and I'll show all of my electron pairs. We have plus on the middle nitrogen and a negative formal charge on each of the other two. 
then the THF, that is our polar A product solvent, uh, again, one of the classic ones that you are bound to see in your course, so you want to remember that one. And then when we look at our substrate, the OCH3 is not a typical living group, so if I have something else in the molecule, I'm not going to consider that. And I do have something else in my molecule, and I have bromine, which is a typical living group, and uh, since this is a good living group, I'm going to perform substitution at this carbon containing my living group, so I'm going to do the substitution over here, meaning that my azide is going to come in, attack that carbon, and displace the bromine away from this molecule. Since bromine is sitting on the wedge, it means that in the final product, I will have to end up with my azide N3 on a dash. Notice that I'm not going to do anything with the carbon with CH3. Since my living group was sitting on the green atom, that is the only atom that I'm changing. And my OCH3 is sitting on this pink atom, and I have never performed any attack or anything on the pink atom, which means that that atom stays just as is. Here is the next set of questions. Now, these questions are a little trickier and will require you to pay some extra attention. In each of these examples, we have two potential living groups and only one equivalent of our nuclear file. So we have to choose which of the living groups we are going to displace. So in the first case, I have a chlorine, which is my potential living group, and I have an iodine, which is also a potential living group. However, there is a big difference between them. The chlorine atom is sitting on the sp3 hybridized atom, so which means that the reaction can occur there. However, the iodine, while well, that one is sitting on the sp2 hybridized atom, and as we know, there is no SN2 on sp2. So, although iodine is a wonderful living group, I am not actually going to consider iodine as a living group in this case. Here, I am going to have cyanide attacking my green atom where the chlorine is, displacing the chlorine, giving me final product looking like this, where iodine stays just as is, and instead of chlorine, I now have the cyanide group. In the next example, I have two iodines. So as a living group ability goes, both iodines, they are the same. However, there is a big difference where exactly they're located in the molecule. The iodine on the left is sitting on a tertiary atom, while iodine on the right, while well, that one is sitting on the primary atom. And as we know, SN2 reactions, they are extremely sensitive towards their hindrances, which means that the primary carbon with the living group, the one on the right, is going to be more reactive towards the nucleophilic attack. So, once my N3, my azide, comes in and displaces that iodine, I'm going to end up with my product where I have N3 over here now, and the left iodine stays as is because that position is quite unreactive. And so the last example here seems to be relatively simple on the surface because we have two iodines, each of those iodines is a secondary uh, living group, so looks like there is no difference here. However, there is a difference between those. First of all, what I'm noticing about this example is that this is a six-membered ring, so perhaps it's a good idea to draw a chair conformation for this molecule first. And if I were to draw the most stable chair conformation, I'd get a picture like this. This particular chair conformation is the most stable one because our bulkiest group, which is going to be this isopropyl over here, is in the equatorial position, so that pretty much locks our conformation. Now, we have two iodines. The iodine that is closer to us, the one over here in the equatorial position, if I wanted to substitute that iodine, I would have to supply the electron density onto the sigma star anti-bonding orbital, which is located over here. So this is my sigma star. And the problem with this orbital is that it actually experiences a lot of steric hindrances. We have hydrogen here, hydrogen here, 
and there is another hydrogen down there. So attacking from this position like that is quite difficult. So if my nuclear file wanted to come in from there, it will see a lot of uh, hindrance and a lot of roadblocks in order to get uh, to that orbital. However, my other iodine, the sigma star for that one, is right over there. So if I wanted to do the nucleophilic attack from this direction, well, nothing really stops me and there is no steric hindrance or anything of that sort. It will be also very useful if you build the uh, six-membered ring out of your molecular model kit and actually see how those orbitals line up in the molecule and see for yourself that once we have a group in the axial position, nothing prevents the attack, which means that in this case, the iodine which is right over here, is going to be the most reactive in our reaction. So when my reaction happens, the negatively charged sulfur is going to attack that carbon faster and giving me the final product looking like this, where the isopropyl is still looking at me, the iodine on the right side is still looking at me, and now the sulfur with the methyl group on it is sitting on the dash like that. And finally, here is a ranking question. Some instructors really have a soft spot for ranking questions, so I had to include that one uh, here as well. And in this case, we're looking at our molecules and trying to decide which of those molecules is going to be the fastest in the SN2 reaction and which one is going to be the slowest. We will assume that in this case we have the same nucleophile and the same reaction conditions, so the only thing that is different is our starting material. So the first thing that's kind of jumping at me is the position of my living group in the first row over here. All of those iodines are uh, the same, so from the living group ability they are going to be the same. I have the primary position for A, I also have the primary position for B, I have the secondary position for C, and I have the primary position for D. However, the thing that jumps at me right away in the case of D, that primary position is the sp2 hybridized position, and as we don't normally see the SN2 substitution on sp2 hybridized atoms, that one is going to be the slowest right away. So let's call it number four as the slowest one. Then I have the secondary position and two primary positions. So as primary positions are typically more reactive uh, than the secondary position, I'm going to say that my secondary position is number three. Among my two primary positions, the A molecule A is more sterically hindered than molecule B, so I would say the molecule B is the fastest one and molecule A is the second one in its rate. In the next one, we have primary position across the board for all of those. So we have primary position for iodine, primary position for bromine, primary position for chlorine, and primary position for fluorine. So the first thing that we want to consider here is the nature of our living group. And as it so happens, the more stable the living group with the negative charge, the better of the living group it is. So if I were to compare F- minus versus Cl- minus versus Br- minus versus I minus, well, iodine being the largest atom is going to be the most stable with a negative charge, so iodine is a better living group than bromine, bromine better than chlorine, and chlorine is better than fluorine. Remember that when it comes to stability of the negative charge, the size is more important than the electronegativity. This is a most common mistake that I see students make. They always assume that electronegativity is such a big deal, while in reality it's actually not. Size is more important than electronegativity, and since iodine is at the very bottom of our periodic table, that atom is relatively large, so iodine is going to be the most stable with a negative charge compared to fluorine. However, there is a trick to this question. Our chlorine 
sitting on this carbon uh, over here, that carbon is what we would refer to as an allylic position. So we are right next to a double bond. And I'm not going to go deeply into the orbital uh, interactions there and how molecular orbitals work in this case, but remember that when it comes to allylic positions, they are incredibly reactive towards the uh, substitution and elimination reactions. So here, although chlorine is not the best living group, it is the best position for the living group in general, which means that C is actually going to be the most reactive. I'm going to call it number one. And then we just go into uh, follow the uh, nature of our halogens. So the next one is going to be iodine number two. Next one is going to be bromine. And the least reactive is going to be the fluorine as the slowest. And finally, when it comes to my last question here, I only have two molecules, and this one also has a six-membered ring, so this is a similar situation to what we have already seen uh, on the previous page, where we need to consider the chair conformations for our molecules. So for molecule A, if I were to draw the most stable chair conformation for that one, I would end up with something like that. Likewise, if I were to draw a chair conformation for molecule B, again, the most stable chair conformation, I will see something like this. So in this case, in B, my iodine is axial, while in A, my iodine is equatorial. And as we have seen already in the previous page, the axial living groups are more reactive towards the nucleophiles because it is much easier to attack it from this position, which means that molecule B is going to be more reactive. So if you like this small problem solving video and want me to make more of these, let me know in the comments below, subscribe and give it a like, and I'll see you in the next video.